This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Kristen Hughes. The Red House Mystery by A. A. Milne. Chapter 2 Mr. Gillingham Gets Out at the Wrong Station. Whether Mark Ablett was a bore or not depended on the point of view, but it may be said at once that he never bored his company on the subject of his early life. However, stories get about. There is always somebody who knows. It was understood, and this anyhow on Mark's own authority, that his father had been a country clergyman. It was said that, as a boy, Mark had attracted the notice and patronage of some rich old spinster of the neighborhood, who had paid for his education, both at school and university. At about the time when he was coming down from Cambridge, his father had died, leaving behind him a few debts, as a warning to his family, and a reputation for short sermons, as an example to his successor. Neither warning nor example seems to have been effective. Mark went to London, with an allowance from his patron, and, it is generally agreed, made acquaintance with the money-lenders. He was supposed, by his patron, and any others who inquired, to be writing. But what he wrote, other than letters asking for more time to pay, has never been discovered. However, he attended the theatres and music-halls very regularly, no doubt with a view to some serious article in The Spectator on the decadence of the English stage. Fortunately, from Mark's point of view, his patron died during his third year in London, and left him all the money he wanted. From that moment his life loses its legendary character, and becomes more a matter of history. He settled his accounts with the money-lenders, abandoned his crop of wild oats to the harvesting of others, and became in his turn a patron. He patronized the arts. It was not only usurers who discovered that Mark Ablett no longer wrote for money. Editors were now offered free contributions as well as free lunches. Publishers were given agreements for an occasional slender volume, in which the author paid all expenses and waived all royalties. Promising young painters and poets dined with him, and he even took a theatrical company on tour, playing host and lead with equal lavishness. He was not what most people call a snob. A snob has been defined carelessly as a man who loves a lord, and more carefully, as a mean lover of mean things, which would be a little unkind to the peerage if the first definition were true. Mark had his vanities undoubtedly, but he would sooner have met an actor-manager than an earl. He would have spoken of his friendship with Dante, had that been possible more glibly than of his friendship with the Duke. Call him a snob if you like, but not the worst kind of snob. A hanger-on, but to the skirts of art, not society. A climber, but in the neighborhood of Parnassus, not Hay Hill. His patronage did not stop at the arts. It also included Matthew Cayley, a small cousin of thirteen, whose circumstances were as limited as had been Mark's own before his patron had rescued him. He sent the Cayley cousin to school and Cambridge. His motives, no doubt, were unworldly enough at first, a mere repaying to his account in the recording angel's book of the generosity which had been lavished on himself, a laying up of treasure in heaven. But it is probable that, as the boy grew up, Mark's designs for his future were based on his own interests as much as those of his cousin, and that a suitably educated Matthew Cayley of twenty-three was felt by him to be a useful property for a man in his position, a man, that is to say, whose vanities left him so little time for his affairs. Cayley, then, at twenty-three, looked after his cousin's affairs. By this time Mark had bought the red house and the considerable amount of land which went with it. Cayley superintended the necessary staff. His duties indeed were many. He was not quite secretary, not quite land agent, not quite business adviser, not quite companion, but something of all four. 
Mark leant upon him and called him Kay, objecting quite rightly in the circumstances to the name of Matthew. Kay, he felt, was, above all, dependable. A big, heavy-jawed, solid fellow, who didn't bother you with unnecessary talk. A boon to a man who liked to do most of the talking himself. Cayley was now twenty-eight, but had all the appearance of forty, which was his patron's age. Spasmodically they entertained a good deal at the Red House, and Mark's preference—call it kindliness or vanity, as you please—was for guests who were not in a position to repay his hospitality. Let us have a look at them as they came down to that breakfast, of which Stevens, the parlour-maid, has already given us a glimpse. The first to appear was Major Rumbold, a tall, grey-haired, grey-moustached, silent man, wearing a Norfolk coat and grey flannel trousers, who lived on his retired pay and wrote natural history articles for the paper. He inspected the dishes on the side-table, decided carefully on kedgeree, and got to work on it. He had passed on to a sausage by the time of the next arrival. This was Bill Beverley, a cheerful young man in white flannel trousers and a blazer. "'Hello, Major,' he said as he came in. "'How's the goat?' "'It isn't gout,' said the Major gruffly. "'Well, whatever it is,' the Major grunted. "'I make a point of being polite at breakfast,' said Bill, helping himself largely to porridge. "'Most people are so rude. That's why I asked you.' "'But don't tell me if it's a secret. "'Coffee?' he added as he poured himself out a cup. "'No, thanks. I never drink till I've finished eating.' "'Quite right, Major. It's only manners.' He sat down opposite to the other. "'Well, we've got a good day for our game. It's going to be dashed hot, but that's where Betty and I score. On the fifth green, your old wound, the one you got in that frontier skirmish in forty-three, will begin to trouble you.' On the eighth, your liver, undermined by years of curry, will drop to pieces. On the twelfth— Oh, shut up, you ass! Well, I'm only warning you. Hello, good morning, Miss Norris. I was just telling the Major what was going to happen to you and him this morning. Do you want any assistance, or do you prefer choosing your own breakfast? Please don't get up, said Miss Norris. I'll help myself. Good morning, Major. She smiled pleasantly at him. The Major nodded. "'Good morning. Going to be hot.' "'As I was telling him,' began Bill. "'That's where. Hello, here's Betty. Morning, Cayley.' Betty Calladine and Cayley had come in together. Betty was the eighteen-year-old daughter of Mrs. John Calladine, widow of the painter, who was acting hostess on this occasion for Mark. Ruth Norris took herself seriously as an actress, and, on her holidays, seriously as a golfer. She was quite competent as either. Neither the stage society nor Sandwich had any terrors for her. "'By the way, the car will be round at ten thirty, said Cayley, looking up from his letters. "'You're lunching there and driving back directly afterwards. Isn't that right?' "'I don't see why we shouldn't have two rounds.' said Bill hopefully. "'Much too hot in the afternoon,' said the Major. "'Get back comfortably for tea.' Mark came in. He was generally the last. He greeted them and sat down to toast and tea. Breakfast was not his meal. The others chattered gently while he read his letters. "'Good God!' said Mark suddenly. There was an instinctive turning of heads toward him. "'I beg your pardon, Miss Norris. Sorry, Betty.' Miss Norris smiled her forgiveness. She often wanted to say it herself, particularly at rehearsals. "'I say, Kay—' He was frowning to himself, annoyed, puzzled. He held up a letter and shook it. "'Who do you think this is from?' Cayley, at the other end of the table, shrugged his shoulders. How could he possibly guess? "'Robert,' said Mark. "'Robert?' It was difficult to surprise Cayley. "'Well?' "'It's all very well to say well like that,' said Mark peevishly. "'He's coming here this afternoon.' 
I thought he was in Australia or somewhere. Of course, so did I. He looked across at Rumbold. Got any brothers, Major? No. Well, take my advice and don't have any. Not likely to now, said the Major. Bill laughed. Miss Norris said politely, But you haven't any brothers, Mr. Ablett. One, said Mark grimly. If you're back in time, you'll see him this afternoon. He'll probably ask you to lend him five pounds. Don't. Everybody felt a little uncomfortable. I've got a brother, said Bill helpfully, but I always borrow from him. Like Robert, said Mark. When was he last in England? asked Cayley. About fifteen years ago, wasn't it? You'd have been a boy, of course. Yes, I remember seeing him once about then, but I didn't know if he'd been back since. No, not to my knowledge. Mark, still obviously upset, returned to his letter. Personally, said Bill, I think relations are a great mistake. All the same, said Betty, a little daringly, it must be rather fun having a skeleton in the cupboard. Mark looked up, frowning. If you think it's fun, I'll hand him over to you, Betty. If he's anything like he used to be, and like his few letters have been, well, Kay knows. Cayley grunted. All I knew was that one didn't ask questions about him. It may have been meant as a hint to any too curious guest not to ask more questions, or a reminder to his host not to talk too freely in front of strangers although he gave it the sound of a mere statement of fact. But the subject dropped, to be succeeded by the more fascinating one of the coming foursome. Mrs. Calladine was driving over with the players in order to lunch with an old friend who lived near the links, and Mark and Cayley were remaining at home on affairs. Apparently affairs were now to include a prodigal brother, but that need not make the foursome less enjoyable. At about the time when the Major, for whatever reasons, was fluffing his tea-shot at the sixteenth, and Mark and his cousin were at their business at the Red House, an attractive gentleman of the name of Antony Gillingham was handing up his ticket at Woodham Station and asking his way to the village. Having received directions, he left his bag with the station-master and walked off leisurely. He is an important person to this story so that it is well we should know something about him before letting him loosen it. Let us stop him at the top of the hill on some excuse, and have a good look at him. The first thing we realize is that he is doing more of the looking than we are. Above a clean-cut, clean-shaven face, of the type usually associated with the navy, he carries a pair of grey eyes which seem to be absorbing every detail of our person. To strangers, this look is almost alarming at first, until they discover that his mind is very often elsewhere, that he has, so to speak, left his eyes on guard, while he himself follows a train of thought in another direction. Many people do this, of course, when, for instance, they are talking to one person and trying to listen to another. But their eyes betray them. Antony's never did. He had seen a good deal of the world with those eyes, though never as a sailor. When at the age of twenty-one he came into his mother's money, four hundred pounds a year, old Gillingham looked up from the Stock Breeders' Gazette to ask what he was going to do. "'See the world,' said Antony. "'Well, send me a line from America or wherever you get to.' "'Right,' said Antony. Old Gillingham returned to his paper. Antony was a younger son, and, on the whole, not so interesting to his father as the cadets of certain other families. Champion Burkett's, for instance. But then, Champion Burkett was the best Hereford bull he had ever bred. Antony, however, had no intention of going further away than London. His idea of seeing the world was to see, not countries, but people— and to see them from as many angles as possible. There are all sorts in London if you know how to look at them. So Antony looked at them, 
from various strange corners, from the viewpoint of the valet, the newspaper reporter, the waiter, the shop assistant. With the independence of four hundred pounds a year behind him, he enjoyed it immensely. He never stayed long in one job, and generally closed his connection with it by telling his employer, contrary to all etiquette as understood between master and servant, exactly what he thought of him. He had no difficulty in finding a new profession. Instead of experience and testimonials, he offered his personality and a sporting bet. He would take no wages the first month. And if he satisfied his employer, double wages the second. He always got his double wages. He was now thirty. He had come to Waldheim for a holiday because he liked the look of the station. His ticket entitled him to travel further, but he had always intended to please himself in the matter. Waldheim attracted him, and he had a suitcase in the carriage with him and money in his pocket. Why not get out? The landlady of the George was only too glad to put him up, and promised that her husband would drive over that afternoon for his luggage. "'And you would like some lunch, I expect, sir?' "'Yes, but don't give yourself any trouble about it. Cold anything you've got. "'What about beef, sir?' she asked, as if she had a hundred varieties of meat to select from, and was offering him her best. "'That will do splendidly. And a pint of beer.' While he was finishing his lunch, the landlord came in to ask about the luggage. Antony ordered another pint, and soon had him talking. "'It must be rather fun to keep a country in.' he said, thinking that it was about time he started another profession. "'I don't know about fun, sir. It gives us a living in a bit over.' "'You ought to take a holiday,' said Antony, looking at him thoughtfully. "'Funny thing you're saying that,' said the landlord with a smile. "'Another gentleman, over from the Red House, was saying that only yesterday. He offered to take my place and all.' He laughed rumblingly. "'The Red House?' "'Not the Red House Stanton?' "'That's right, sir. Stanton's the next station to Waldheim. The Red House is about a mile from here. Mr. Ablett's.' Antony took a letter from his pocket. It was addressed from the Red House Stanton, and signed Bill. "'Good old Bill,' he murmured to himself. "'He's getting on.' Antony had met Bill Beverley two years before in a tobacconist's shop. Gillingham was on one side of the counter, and Mr. Beverley on the other. Something about Bill—his youth and freshness, perhaps—attracted Antony. And when cigarettes had been ordered, and an address given to which they were to be sent, he remembered that he had come across an aunt of Beverley's once at a country house. Beverley and he met again a little later at a restaurant. Both of them were in evening dress, but they did different things with their napkins and Antony was the more polite of the two. However, he still liked Bill, so on one of his holidays when he was unemployed he arranged an introduction through a mutual friend. Beverly was a little inclined to be shocked when he was reminded of their previous meetings, but his uncomfortable feelings soon wore off, and he and Antony quickly became intimate. But Bill generally addressed him as Dear Madman when he happened to write. Antony decided to stroll over to the Red House after lunch and call upon his friend. Having inspected his bedroom, which was not quite the lavender-smelling country inn bedroom of fiction, but sufficiently clean and comfortable, he set out over the fields. As he came down the drive and approached the old red-brick front of the house, there was a lazy murmur of bees in the flower borders, a gentle cooing of pigeons in the tops of the elms and from the distant lawns the whirr of a mowing machine, that most restful of all country sounds. And in the hall a man was banging at a locked door, and shouting, "'Open the door, I say! Open the door!' Hullo, said Antony in amazement. End of chapter 2